Uh, as we've said, we're starting a new series today, and as we launch into that, I have a question to kind of get us warmed up a little bit. When you were growing up, who was it that you looked up to? Who, who was it that was your hero to the point that you had their poster up on your wall? Or who's poster do you have up on your wall now, all right? Maybe your mom won't let you put posters up on your wall. I mean, that's that could happen. So if you didn't have a poster up on your wall, who would it have been? Who would you have admired so much that you would have wanted to see their face every day? Take a second and think about it, and then turn and tell your neighbor. Last service, we did have one gentleman say Farrah Fawcett. I kind of expected it to come. It happened. So if you're thinking about it, She's already taken. <laughs> Chuck, yeah. All right. Sounds like a few of us had some posters. Lincoln does not have a poster on his wall, but he's got his hand raised. I guess he wants one. Who do you want on your wall, Lincoln? What? A poster of Jesus. What a good little child you are. <laughs> a plus for today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he wants something. I'll get you those Robux after service, okay? All right. Read. What was that? Me? <gasps> That's so kind. That's the only one that could have talked that, Lincoln. Really <laughs> Why, thank you, Reed. Uh, okay, anybody else have someone on their wall? Yes, Miss Brenda. Oh, tell us all about it. Right. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy Hendrix. Yep. And we, he's, yep. That's, he told us that first service and we all think that he's learned a thing or two from him for sure. For sure. Somebody else poster on your wall. Beatles. Yep. Who is it? Your uncle. Which one? Oh, that's sweet. Okay. An uncle. Who else? Olivia Newton-John. Newton Thank you. Yes. Next to Farah, huh? Ozzy Smith. Why Ozzy Smith? The Wizard, yes. Yeah? Big baseball fan. Still, still a Cardinals fan? We've never talked about this. I'm a big Braves fan here. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> all right. One more person. I want to know who Melinda had on her wall. That's what I want to know. There you go. There you go. Yeah, there you go. I like it. I saw Joe's hand go up. Chipper Jones. There you go. See? Good Braves fan over there. I see. Uh, I did not have this poster. I wish I would have had this poster. I, I'm sure that they did not make posters of women's basketball players back in my day, but this would have been on my wall. This is Cheryl Swoops. Um, Cheryl Swoops, I watched in real time her win an NCAA championship, and then she went on to play for Team USA because there was no WNBA at that time, right, for her to go to, but when they finally created the WNBA, Cheryl Swoops was the first woman ever signed to women's professional basketball. Um, Nike even made a shoe uh, in her name, which I had to own. My parents had to search all over the country to find them for Christmas one year. But in my mind, Cheryl Swoops was untouchable. She was larger than life. She was perfect. However, as you and I get older, and I'm sorry, kids, to burst your bubble a little bit, but, but what we learn is that these heroes of ours, that they're kind of just humans like us. Yes, they're distinguished in one area or another, but they have, they have not just victories, they also have losses, they have successes and they have missteps, they have strengths and they have weaknesses. We discover that they are far more like us than we ever imagined, far from perfect. 
Well, if posters would have been a thing back in the day of the Bible, then I think a lot of people would have had the the man that we're going to talk about the next 10 weeks up on their wall. They would have had King David hanging there. And why not? He has quite the resume, right? This is the guy who is able to take down a giant with just a sling. The guy who led armies and who became king all while playing the lyre and writing over 3,000 songs, which we still sing today. We just sang one. That was Psalm 40 that we sang that last um, song uh, that Jeremy led. So, I mean, he's pretty accomplished, but... He's also so much more complex and complicated than all those accomplishments. He's a man who would get very down, very sad, very depressed at times. Just read back through some of those Psalms. And he was a man who had some pretty significant missteps. I mean, we're talking about committing adultery and plotting murder here. Yet the Bible describes him as being a man after God's own heart. It's interesting, you know. How does that work? In David's story, I think we discover something very important. We discover that God's desire for us was never meant to be these perfect performers who somehow transcend our humanity through heroic efforts, but rather his desire for us is to simply walk through this life with him, becoming more and more the humans he always desired for us to be in the first place. That's what happens with David. David, he journeys along through life with God in this very honest, in this very humble, in this very heartfelt relationship, and he is significantly shaped in the process. However, it all begins with him discovering that he has first been chosen. Many of you know that I grew up not too far from here, and I had this large extended family. Um, Here I am with my cousins on the spark side, um, just because you might be wondering, I'm the one in the hat and the jumpsuit there in the middle. Um, I always look to Callan for fashion. Is this ever going to come back, this look in the middle? No, probably not. Um, I also want you all to notice, you like here on the sides, these gentlemen, these cousins of mine, they were calling what? was called then wind suits. And I need you to know my generation fought harder against the wind than any other generation that has ever lived, okay? We took it very serious. (laughs) Okay, but um, those three guys there in the front, they're my older cousins, and I thought that they had hung the moon, right? Like, these guys could do no wrong. They were the funniest and the smartest people on the planet, and so wherever they went, I wanted to go with them to the point that my nickname became Me Too, all right? Um, so like, you know, they're going to play basketball. Me too, right? Like I can play or they're, uh, digging a big hole in my grandmother's backyard to make a fort. Hand me a shovel. I can move some dirt, right? Um, they're all going to jump off a cliff. All right, let's go. But a lot of times, you know, that wasn't really cool for me to go along with them. Um, But I just wanted so badly to be a part of what they were up to. And so sometimes they did actually let me go along. In retrospect, it's probably because their parents made them. Because this is kind of what would happen once I got there. You know, we would get up to the basketball court and instead of being chosen for a team, I became the person whose job it was to chase the ball down the hill or to climb under the car whenever it had gotten stuck. Or when we were um, digging the fort in the backyard, I didn't get a shovel. I was the lookout for my grandmother who had no idea we were digging a five-foot hole in her backyard. In a sense, I was with them, and I was a part of what they were doing. Yet, at the same time, I felt completely left out. It's a terrible feeling, isn't it? A feeling that I think all of us have felt at some time or another You know, being a part of a a team, yet feeling like you're an outsider that doesn't belong, or being in a room full of people at a conference or a party and seeing them all seem to click, and, and you are feeling all by yourself. Maybe even being a part of a church family and and looking around and seeing all these happy people that seem to know each other, but feeling like you're not really known. I know that feeling well. But what you might not expect is that the mighty, great King David of the Bible, he knew this same feeling as well. 
He was the eighth and final son in his family in a culture in which seven was the the perfect number. Seven was a number that symbolized completeness. Seven symbolized something being whole. And so we have David here as the eighth child, kind of this this unnecessary extra, you know, a, a superfluous addition to this family that in essence was already full. He's born into to Jesse's family, and soon he discovers the sting of not feeling like he belonged. Um, in fact, here in the very first scene recounted about his life, where do we find him? We find him out watching sheep by himself alone. It seems that as the youngest in his family, he's once again drawn the short straw. And so he's doing this very unglamorous, lonely work of looking after the animals while his brothers are off doing more important stuff, like being warriors. On one particular day, while David is out shepherding his sheep, unbeknownst to him, something huge, something epic is happening back home. Samuel, the great prophet of Israel, has come to his little hometown of Bethlehem. This visit, it was outside of Samuel's normal domain. And so it has all the elders in the village just a little on edge, a little concerned. It's kind of like if you're at work and suddenly the CEO shows up at your desk or um, you're at home and some high-ranking government, government official comes knocking at your door, the question you would probably have in your mind is the question that's on the elders of the village's mind. They ask Samuel, the great prophet, do you come in peace? It's a fair question for Samuel, but it's one that kind of has a complex reply. And so y'all got to hang with me here. We got to get the backstory. All right. We're going to take the long way around, but I promise it's all going to fit together. All right. So here's the backstory. You have to understand that Samuel is not only a prophet, he's also a judge of the people of Israel, uh, which means that he and God, they're pretty close. They're pretty tight, right? He has some power within the nation of Israel. Um, You have to go back a little further to understand that before he was a judge, though, when the people of Israel had come out of slavery in Egypt and come into the promised land, God had told the people that God himself would be their king, that he was the one that was going to rule over them. He was going to reign with love and justice, and he was going to faithfully protect them from all of their enemies. But from time to time, he would have people like Samuel who would come along and that he would kind of help God. They would be partners together, ruling over God's people. But God is king. Now, Samuel, he's gotten kind of old, you know, his time here on earth, it seems like it's going to be short. People are wondering what the next thing is. And his sons are really not great options. And so the people of God, they come to Samuel and they say, we want you to give us a king. Awkward, right? Because they already have a king and his name is God. And so Samuel tries to remind them of this. God is your king. And he tries to tell them all of these downfalls of having a human ruler, but they don't care. Essentially, they say, we want a king that we and that everyone else can see. We want a king like all these other countries. It was this tense moment between the people and Samuel and God. But at the end of it all, God says, you know what, Samuel, this isn't about you. You know, this is really about me. It's okay. Go ahead. Give them their king. And so Samuel did, and his name was Saul. Now, Saul was a man who seemed to have a whole lot going for him. Saul was uh, from a, a father who the Bible said was a man of means. And not only that, but he was more handsome than anyone else in all of Israel. And then to top it all off, he was taller than everyone else as well, which is essentially the job description for being a king in that day, in that age, in the ancient Near East. Those were the requirements, right? Tall and handsome, and you can rule. And so Saul was the obvious choice for the people of Israel who want a king that they and everyone else can see. He was the obvious choice to everyone except to Saul himself. 
when Samuel reveals to him that he has been chosen by God, his first reaction is one of, of deflection. He says, who, me? He sternly objects. Don't you know that I am from the smallest tribe and, and the least of its clans? He doesn't see all that God has given him. He only sees what he lacks. However, God through Samuel has very clearly said, you are chosen. There was no, if you prove yourself to me, there was no, if you have enough power and prestige, there was no, if you are perfect from now into eternity. No, it's, he just said, you are chosen, period, the end. And so despite Saul's objections, what Samuel does is he goes ahead and he anoints Saul as king. He pours out oil over his head to symbolize that he's being set apart for this special purpose. And then the Holy Spirit comes on Saul to give him the power that he needs to lead as this mark of his chosenness. However, a sh just a few short days later, whenever it comes time for Samuel to bring out the king that the people and everyone else can see, guess who is missing? Saul <laughs> he's hiding in the supplies God had made it abundantly clear through the words of Samuel through the anointing with oil with the coming of the Holy Spirit that you are my chosen one but Saul was suffering from what we sometimes call today imposter syndrome you know he felt like a fraud he was so blinded by his own insecurities that he couldn't see that he had already been chosen as king. He didn't get that this wasn't something that he had to earn or deserve, but rather that, that it was this gift of God, from God from him to enjoy. But that's what fear can do to us. You know, fear, it keeps us so consumed with ourselves that we cannot see the goodness of God that is right in front of us. It tells us that somehow we have to be more or we have to be better to merit our place in God's story when in reality, God has already declared that you are a part of my family. Unfortunately, this never sinks in for Saul. And so as he continues to rule, he has this fear that is reigning in his heart to try to, to, to prove to others that, that he is um, the king, to try to earn his status. He does things like making offerings to God that God has told him to wait for Samuel to make. Why? Because scripture mentions he was afraid. He was afraid that the men were getting tired of waiting around and that the enemy might attack before Samuel gets there trying to deserve his position as king. He did things like keep back spoils of war that God clearly told him, you have to destroy it all. Why? Because scripture says he was afraid. He was afraid of what the men would think if, if they didn't get to keep some of it. And, and there's this little side note too about him going up and setting up a monument to make his own name great. Again and again and again, Saul's fear drove him to try to prove himself as king, all the while distracting him from his true calling. He was so enslaved by self-doubt that he was not free to receive and then to give God's love to the people that he was supposed to lead. And so eventually God tells Samuel and Samuel tells Saul, it's time for a new king, a new king that will follow God's heart when he leads. Okay, so that was the long way around, but guess where we are again? We are back in Bethlehem because this is why Samuel has come there. He has come in search of this new king. But Samuel, he doesn't exactly tell the elders of the village this, okay? Um, he, he tells them that he is indeed coming in peace and that he has just come to make a sacrifice. Wink, wink, everyone, a sacrifice. Um, it's not a complete lie. In fact, God's told him to say this, and he's even brought a heifer along with him to, to do this very thing. But it's not the whole truth at the same time. Because think about it, you know, like, it's kind of a dangerous thing to come and choose a new king while the old king is still reigning, right? And so Samuel, he's trying to protect everyone else involved and in them not knowing what's going on because what he is about to do would be considered treason in the eyes of Saul. And so Samuel has been guided by God to go to Jesse. 
And he's told him that the new king is going to come from his family. And so Jesse um, gets together this family for the sacrifice. And he tells them all to consecrate themselves for this. So to wash themselves, to, to wash their clothes, to come ready to be a part of this high holy moment. And so uh, they do. And then Samuel watches very carefully as each of the sons pass him by. The first son passes in front of Samuel. And most people would think the first one's going to be it. That's usually how it worked in that culture. The oldest son, you know, kind of gets the blessing, the one that's chosen. And, and so everyone would have thought maybe he's the one. In fact, even Samuel thought that it was him. In verse 6, he says to himself, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. Remember, those are the very qualities that everyone else in the cultures around them is looking for in a king. The very things that have qualified Saul to lead. But now God says, if there's going to be a king in Israel, then there is going to be a whole new set of expectations for them. This is what he says. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the will, the character of the person. And when that first son passes in front of Samuel, God doesn't see what he's looking for there. He passes Samuel by. And so Jesse calls his next son, his second son, to pass Samuel by. And yet again, it's a miss. He's not the one. And so at this point, everyone listening to the story or reading it the first time would have kind of been like anticipating because every good story worked on the rule of three. It's a tactic in folklore, you know? It's not the first, it's not the second. It's always the third one, right? And so everyone would have been leaning in, waiting to see who this new king would be as the third son passes Samuel by. But guess what? It's a big curveball because it's not him either. And so all the other sons of Jesse pass Samuel by one after another after another. But none of them are the chosen ones. And so at this point, Samuel has to be a little confused. Like, hey, God, didn't you say like the king was going to come from this family? And so the suspense is almost too much as Samuel turns to Jesse and asks him this question. He says, are these all your sons? Seven sons had been consecrated for the sacrifice. And seven sons had passed Samuel by that day. But remember, there is an eighth. There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. In this whole story and in all of scripture, this is the very first mention of David's existence. Um, and evidently when Samuel had arrived in town, no one even thought about going out and telling David about this sacrifice. When Samuel had consecrated all the rest of, of Jesse's family, apparently no one thought to include him in this ritual. If the question, shouldn't David be here, had even come up, they had decided together, nah, don't worry about him. Just leave him out in the field, you know? But now Samuel, the great prophet of Israel, who's been used to make and break kings, specifically requests the presence of this overlooked, undervalued eighth son. And to top it off, um, he, he kind of orders everyone else, you're not allowed to sit down until he comes. All right, they all have to stand up and they have to wait. It's this unbelievable scene as all of these people, all of David's elders are suddenly having to deferentially wait for him, the often ignored and left out one. But finally, this eighth son arrives and with him, the hope of Israel God has seen what he desires in the heart of David, who also, I'm just going to tell you, it does point out in the scripture that he is very handsome as well, but that's not the most important part. It says that God has seen what he needed to see in his heart. And so the Lord said to Samuel, arise, anoint him. This is the one. And as Samuel lifts up the horn to pour out the oil over him, to choose him, to set him apart for the special purpose, 
David, he had even more reason than Saul to object. He had even more reason to try to stop him saying, who, me? You know, he had done nothing to prove himself. There's no mention of any special things he's done at this point except for him looking over a bunch of sheep. He has no power to wield. He's this nobody from nowhere, from this unremarkable family that has foreigners and prostitutes in its tree. He's by no means a perfect man. You know, he, he will disappoint and fail just as much as Saul has. And so fear could have distracted him. Fear could have defeated him before he even began telling him that he was an imposter, telling him that he was a fraud, telling him that, that he's an outsider and he always will be, that he doesn't belong, that he isn't worthy of this calling from God. But David, in this moment of his anointing and in the tumultuous 15 years that will follow as he waits to even become king and in the 40 years that he will eventually reign, he did not let fear get the final say. Instead, he boldly embraced God's grace. He didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. He recognized that this kingship was a gift from God. And so rather than fixing his eyes on himself and what he felt like he was lacking, what he did is he focused on the proven and the powerful and the perfect God that was doing the choosing in that moment. Rather than being enslaved by insecurity, he was set free to live up to his name, David, a name that no one else has had in scripture up to this point, a word that's rooted in a Hebrew word that means beloved. He was set free to let God love him so that he could lead God's people in receiving and giving God's love. By grace, a king he became, a king by which all the other kings of Israel will be measured thereafter. <laughs> and a king through whom God would eventually bring an even greater king, who was also born in that same little town of Bethlehem, a king that was God himself in the flesh, Jesus. He came to live among us as God's chosen one. And through his life and his death and his resurrection, he declared that we all, every single one of us, are chosen as well. In fact, Ephesians 1 tells us that before the creation of the world, so in other words, before we could ever even think to try to earn or deserve anything, that God had already chose us. That before the creation of the world, he had chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight and to be adopted as sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. That before the creation of the world, that he had chosen us for, for redemption and forgiveness of sins and to receive the riches of his grace that he so lavishly gives. Before the creation of the world, he chose us to be marked, to be anointed with his Holy Spirit and to be his special possession in the world, all to the praise of his glory. And so maybe you're here today and you are worn out and you are weary Maybe you're here today and you're distracted and you're defeated like Saul from trying to, to prove yourself to yourself or to others or to God that you belong in God's family. But what if we, like David, just embraced God's grace and started living out of this confident place that we are the chosen ones of God, that we already and always now and forever belong? What if we put an end to fear's reign and we shifted our focus from ourselves and what we think that we are lacking to the goodness of God that is ours for the taking?